Today is Tasmania's day of all its years. Our sovereign lady, Queen of Australia, and her popular husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, hold Hobart's hearts in thrall as they sail up the calm waters of Derwent's estuary. Our royal visitors come to an old land, island of a vanished race now peopled by British descendants of British settlers. Land of quaint animals that have survived great passages of time. Land that is the stepping stone to the regions of penguins, seals and whales. They come to an Australian state whose people enjoy freedom and pastimes comparable to any, whose link with the crown is enduring. Never before, in its dignified history, has Hobart's old world graciousness seen such a cavalier flourish of colours. Its festive dress is a coat of many colours, heightening the charm of stone buildings built in the days of candlelight, red-coated soldiers, sealers and lusty coachmen. Behind waterfront and ancient masonry, the walled bulk of Mount Wellington shelters all from sweeping winds. A mountain that's always a poetic reminder of Tasmania's climbing landscape. Never before were 200,000 eyes cast on the waters with such eagerness, or with such joy as they do on this memorable morning. Gothic. Proud Swan, escorted by Australia, Anzac and Tasmania's ocean-going yachtsman, noses her way along the mirrored river. Past Battery Point, landmark and birthplace of the island's seafaring skill, down through an excited press of small craft to her berth at the edge of the city. Expansive silence greets her near the end of her journey. Everything seems suspended, uplifted, as though a spiritual time limit was being exceeded. Tension mounts as the state's chief citizens appear. His Excellency the Governor boards the yacht to pay first respects of the brief Tasmanian tour. Hobart catches its first glimpse of the royal couple. Tasmania's leaders are presented to Her Majesty and His Royal Highness. Planes of the Royal Australian Air Force, the Army and the Navy contribute to the magnificence of Hobart's welcome to the Royal Couple.
Lord Mayor now receives a loyal address of, address of welcome from the town clerk. He steps to the microphone to present it on behalf of the city. Your most gracious majesty, we, the Lord Mayor, aldermen and citizens of Hobart, extend to your majesty and to his royal highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, a sincere welcome to Hobart, the second oldest city in the Commonwealth of Australia, and trust that your stay in our midst will be full of joy. We recall with great pleasure the visit of your majesty's parents 27 years ago. Such visits exercise a very profound influence on our lives and help us to cement more closely that very real bond which exists between the royal family and each section of our Commonwealth of Nations. With such visits in mind, we were able to listen in to the inspiring coronation ceremony of your majesty, and we feel we had a personal part in it. The older generations of our people will always remember with profound admiration and joy the way in which your late father, his majesty, King George VI, led us, his subjects, through the Second World War. Such ceremonies and such leadership inspire in us a sense of new hope for the future. We are delighted to have the opportunity of reaffirming to you in person our very deep loyalty, devotion and duty to your throne in person, and we wish you and His Royal Highness continued good health and happiness on your tour, and a joyous reunion with your young family on your return. We have the honour to be Your Majesty's most humble servants, signed by the Lord Mayor and the Town Clerk. Your Majesty. me to arrive at the second oldest city in Australia, and I thank you most sincerely for the warmth of your welcome to my husband and myself. As we steamed up the estuary of your beautiful river, I call to mind that it is exactly 150 years since Colonel Collins first viewed the site upon which this capital city has been built and I share your pride of achievement in the development and growth which has been carried out by succeeding generations since those early days. The subsequent history of Hobart has been influenced to a great extent by your magnificent harbour, and it was apparent from the yachts and boats which greeted me today that the seafaring instincts of the people of this island state have been preserved. Your reception of us today, both on land and on water, indicates the fellowship and understanding which exists between Tasmania and the mother country. I thank you, my Lord Mayor, for your kindly references to my beloved father, who had such happy memories of his visit to Hobart. I look forward to my stay here amongst you, and through you, my Lord Mayor, send greetings and good wishes to all the citizens of Hobart. Hobart's response keeps time with the limelight of world's news that shines with exceptional force upon the activities of our Queen.
picturesque scene greets the royal couple at Government House, adding a new chapter to state history as it becomes the royal residence. One hundred strong of Derwent Regiment await Her Majesty's arrival. <music> Government House overlooks a waterway on which some of Tasmania's best history is being written. It feeds aromatic hop fields with oast houses reminiscent of England's Kent. It supplies water and a freightway to the great mill which makes newsprint from our hardwood forests. Rivers and their tributaries cross our land like veins on a leaf, winding with unsuspected beauty through the island's most compelling features. Past rolling downlands of the Huon Valley, once tall timbered forest, but now a demi-paradise of apple orchards and small fruit farms. showcase of a vital part of the island's livelihood, the bounty of the earth is celebrated each year with a traditional apple festival. Waterways, arteries of the Green Island, roll past garden factories and vast projects of Tasmania's waking and stretching industrial giant. Twenty thousand school children from nearly one hundred schools pack North Hobart Oval to give the royal couple a tumultuous greeting. Her Majesty's visit has rekindled a refreshed idea of the place of children in nationhood, and she in turn is inspired by the warmth and affection the youngsters put into their welcome. A welcome that was translated into colourful and graphic action. The Queen came and was among them. It was a time to remember. High hopes were realised when Her Majesty and the Duke paid a visit to the Repatriation General Hospital, perched on the slopes of the mountainside city. From the hospital, the royal visitors make their way to Anglesey Barracks, Australia's oldest military establishment, dating back before the Battle of Waterloo, at one time garrisoned by detachments of famous British regiments, which have included the Royal West Kents, the Queen's own. Both Her Majesty and His Royal Highness plant a tiny yew tree using specially engraved polished shovels to commemorate the occasion.
Moving over the lawns in soft afternoon sunlight, the royal couple round off their visit by inspecting a century-old monument built by British troops to fallen comrades of New Zealand's Maori Wars. Tasmania's unusual historical background is not without its dreams of youth or its harvest of tragedy. And this year of a happy royal visit is also a year of remembrance to our early settlers. When Lieutenant Governor David Collins founded Hobart, he looked on a wild scene that had only known dark eyes of a race now vanished. But Collins had his dream, and we have cities and a nation which grows and strengthens as the years unfold. Collins and the men and women who triumphed over the beckoning immensities of their harsh times are not forgotten. In this hour of celebration of the birthday of our civilization, they are honored by both the first citizen of the British Commonwealth and the people of Tasmania. Queen Elizabeth and His Royal Highness arrive at the site of the commemorative memorial of our 150th anniversary, where Collins first set foot. Before unveiling the memorial, Her Majesty reminded us that we should allow our minds to dwell upon the enterprise of those early pioneers who founded the settlement in such beautiful surroundings. Lovely old St. David's Cathedral was the scene of a wet Sunday morning, but the abiding significance of the cross and the special occasion brought joy and crowds to the peaceful surroundings. Worshippers from offices, factories and farms, from timber country and green sheep lands, from the mines at the foothills of the mountains, came to join Her Majesty and her husband inside and outside the cathedral in morning prayer. The royal couple are met by the dean and bishop, garbed in traditional, richly embroidered vestments of the church. Patient crowds waited for a view of Her Majesty and the Duke emerging from the cathedral. They were rewarded with a glimpse of splendor. More than 20,000 gathered on Queen's Domain to watch the Queen and Duke take part in a moving tribute to Tasmania's war dead. 
to the living who fought in four wars and to those who are bereaved. None shall forget the quiet reverence of Her Majesty as she laid the wreath at the base of the lofty cenotaph. It was sovereign homage with sovereign meaning. His Royal Highness paid tribute to Tasmanian ex-servicemen and women. In mud, jungle and desert, at sea and in the air, and in adversity and in victory, you have helped to write a story of valour and endurance which you can look back on as second to none. Representatives of the island's ex-servicemen's and ex-servicewomen's organizations were presented to the royal couple. Her Majesty and His Royal Highness each plant a poplar tree, known since Roman times as a sign of democratic freedom. While we sleep, these trees will grow, serving to remind us that our lives are dominated by enduring things. They will also serve to remind us that we stand at a moment when the course of history depends upon calm and reasoned public opinion. Life and earth are precious to those who love peace, and he who sows a field, or trains a flower, or plants a tree, is more than all. For the men and women who'd spent a large portion of their lives on the fronts of war, the presence of Her Majesty was a splendid occasion. For beauty is the most unforgettable thing in the world, and beneath it the nations of men move as beneath their pilgrim star. It was a royal day in a royal city, for the proud moment the constitutional centre of the British Commonwealth. It was a time of spectacle, pomp and ceremony, beloved by people of all ages through the ages. It marked the opening of Tasmania's fifth session of its 30th Parliament. Distinguished Tasmanians form a moving pageant against the dignified pile of old Parliament House, scene of many a triumph and defeat in the course of island progress. A progress stemming from the long struggle through the slow sunrise of nearly 1,000 years. We are remote from the throne, but our lives are bound together by the same force of inheritance and freedom, by the same traditions that are the democratic endowments of our forefathers. But our sovereign comes bringing simplicity, freshness and directness of outlook. Her presence on this historic occasion lights a beacon flashing the attention of the world upon us. 
We owe a debt to this beautiful and busiest mother in the world, who is so intimately a woman of our own kind, and still the venerated, emblematic figure in whom is reflected grandest ideals. Queen Elizabeth presents a dazzling sight as she and her husband make their way up the carpeted steps to the Legislative Council. We often hear of the young woman who is our Queen and the young man who is her consort spoken of as symbols of British Commonwealth unity. This is true, but symbols have no power to wake love, loyalty and faith, or the power to touch the human heart, as they have done so many times since their arrival. of fashion combining all the elements of style, elegance and beauty against the marine backdrop of the Derwent made a splendid setting for the Royal Garden Party, the most democratic event of the tour. Four thousand people representing every section of Tasmanian society saw the Queen and Duke in a happy mood. It was a friendly afternoon and a great day, a fitting prelude to a saddened Hobart, which would see its sovereign and her consort for the last time on the morrow. Mist surrounded Cambridge Airport for the royal departure to the northwest. People and schoolchildren joined with the Governor and Lady Cross in a wonderful farewell that rang out against the nearby hills until the Royal Aircraft became lost in the clouds. Their flight takes them over scenery of striking beauty, over mountains, rivers, lakes and tarns from which flow the lifelines of the state's industrial power. Tasmanian engineers have made the mountains yield water power, changed the face of the rugged bushlands with their grafts of pipelines, canals and dams, and enhanced the security of the state. Here too are friendly solitudes of national parks, the urban and industrial lungs of populations now and in the future a reality that's only a pathetic hope in less happy parts of the globe. Tasmania is a part of the vision splendid which we remember in the words of our sovereign. For it is a spacious land with a vigorous healthy people and vast national resources, a promised land. Eyes of thousands of children from the farms, timber centres and hamlets round Wynyard 
scan the skies for the arrival of the Royal Aircraft. And here she comes, into the warm sunlight and warm-hearted welcome of the Northwest. As Her Majesty and the Duke speed out on their triumphal journey, they see much to remind them of their English countryside, transformed in the early years of our making by nostalgic settlers. Flowing pastoral beauty is supported by coastal towns with seaports and airports. A combination of varied resources and sound enterprise has marked the course of the development of the Northwest right from the beginning. Never far from the waters of Bass Strait, the Royal Progress approached Burnie through a rapidly changing formation of sea and bush capes, delighting the Royal visitors as they glided forward to a red carpeted welcome and a luncheon in the town's courtroom. For thousands of children, the entry of the royal couple into Devonport Oval was a star event. Devonport called it Q-Day. Old Man Care was banished in this their field day of staunch loyalty and goodwill to their happy sovereign, and none with more charm than this Tasmanian brownie. Zero hour for Q-Day came, when 2,000 young voices sang, as they had never sung before, Long Live Elizabeth. Thus sang those Britons true, as now we sing to you. Loyalty to our Queen in this domain. May heaven bless your reign, and peace with you remain. Joyous voices now we raise to greet you. Our Queen, our Queen. On this happy occasion, said Her Majesty, in these beautiful surroundings, which remind me so much of England, my thoughts go to the children of England, from whom, as your Queen and theirs, I bring you greetings. The Devonport asked the royal couple to come back again to our island. Island lit with beauty like a flower, its sea of sapphire fringed with ocean snow, whose music and beauty with the changing hour seemed from some inward source to ebb and flow. La Trobe, scene of many an axeman's and plowman's contest in the past, paid tribute through close ranks of saluting citizens. Everyone said, goodbye and God bless you but not before the royal couple had enjoyed a quiet half hour by the waters of lovely Bell's Parade.
soon, Her Majesty and His Royal Highness were at the front door of the state, Launceston, city by the Tamer, geographical centre for a third of the island's population, headquarters of many big industrial enterprises. Our northern city's hour of glory was brief, but in the fleeting moments of the visit, the people of this beautiful and industrious centre gave to their sovereign and her husband a splendid gay welcome. By the mayor of Launceston, the royal couple are escorted to the dais. Civic dignitaries are presented. Her Majesty and His Royal Highness move on to Launceston's epic and gala scene at York Park. No age shall dim the proud moments of this occasion. The flashing pageant of Tasmania's children, the sudden and gorgeous drama set against native earth and sky. with all its glowing tints of youth, is more than a tribute of welcome. It's a profound message telling all that our children are heirs to a robust tradition that has not altered down the centuries. Her Majesty and the Duke look not only at a wonderful reception on the part of Tasmania's youth, but they see before them the human products of a democratic and free way of life. Liberally educated men and women of tomorrow, who will not forget the essential meaning of the royal visit.
Royal Highness make their final circuit of the Oval. They wave to the healthy children whose love and interest has brightened and highlighted the whole course of their tour. Tasmania's farewell to the royal couple was marked with the same homage and respect accorded them upon the morning of their arrival. As excitement and celebration draws to a close at Western Junction Airport, we reflect that it's been a time which the oldest of us are proud to have lived to see, and which the youngest will remember all their lives. Her Majesty inspects her last royal guard on Tasmanian soil. Escorted by Tasmania's Premier, Robert Cosgrove, Queen Elizabeth bids goodbye to members of her government, officials of the Crown and distinguished members of the public. Her Majesty and His Royal Highness take their leave of an island people who have been greatly honoured by their visit. In this hour, Tasmania speaks with one voice. God bless Queen Elizabeth and His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. God bless the royal children.